Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. My name is Philip. If you haven't met me already, my job as a counsellor and a psychologist is to help you with all things mental health. Remember to like this video, subscribe, see plenty more to come. The Crown's just come out on Netflix, and as a result, I was thinking maybe I should react to it. But rather than reacting to The Crown, I thought actually what would be more impactful is to give you what I felt is a more meaningful experience by watching some of the original tapes of Princess Diana being interviewed by Martin Bashir. It's coming from her mouth. It's not dramatized by Netflix or anyone else. So let's relate to Diana from her point of view. How did the rest of the royal family react when they learned that the child that you would have was going to be a boy? Mm -hmm. Well, everybody was thrilled to bits. It's been a quite a difficult pregnancy. I hadn't been very well throughout it. So by the time William arrived, it was great relief because it was all peaceful again and I was well for a time. Then I was unwell with postnatal depression, mm. which no one ever discusses postnatal depression. You have to read about it afterwards. Something that I just want to highlight is how it's been seen as something negative or wrong with the woman. Almost that she's just had a child. Why should you be sad? It's the most natural thing in the world to give birth. And it's so sad to hear that Diana was, again, relieved that she's having a boy and then not able to understand or talk about postnatal depression unless she read about it. It felt like a really lonely place for her. And that in itself was a bit of a difficult time. You'd wake up in the morning feeling you didn't want to get out of bed, uh, you felt misunderstood, and um, you just very, very low in yourself. Was this completely out of character for you? Yes, very much so. Mm. I've never had, a, never had had a depression in my life. But then when I analysed it, I could see that the changes I'd made in the last year had all caught up with me. And my body had said, we want a rest. Mm. Why was she not able to ask people for help? Why was she not able to connect with herself and talk to other people and say, I want a rest? It feels like, again, another expectation placed on Diana to be a mother, step up, be happy that you've had a child. And it's not as easy as that. Her whole world had changed. She's allowed to rest. She's allowed to be sad. She's allowed to be happy too. But it doesn't feel that there's any autonomy for her to be herself. It feels like she's marching to someone else's beat. What was the, the family's reaction to your postnatal depression? Well, maybe I was the first person ever to be in this family who ever had a depression or was ever openly tearful. And obviously that was daunting because if you've never seen it before, how do you support it? On that note, who is it daunting for? Was it daunting for her that she was suffering post of depression and she was having to talk about it? Or did she connect to other people being daunted by Diana being or suffering from depression? You know, she's still thinking about other people. Can you see just how much she's having to think about what she's saying and how her whole life is being dictated to by someone else, whether it's the royal family or anyone else. It's so important to connect to yourself and think, what are my needs during this time? If I'm feeling depressed, why is that? How can I get the help and support? And it's such a shame that she didn't feel that she could be sad in herself and be picked up or helped by anyone around her. When no one listens to you, or you feel no one's listening to you, all sorts of things start to happen. For instance, you have so much pain inside yourself that you try and hurt yourself on the outside because you want help, but it's the wrong help you're asking for. People see it as crying wolf or attention seeking, mm -hmm. and they think because you're in the media all the time, you've got enough attention, inverted commas. But I was actually crying out because I wanted to get better in order to go forward and continue my duty and my role as wife, mother, Princess of Wales. Mm, again, her duty, and not being happy in herself, but she wanted to carry out her duty. And self-harm is commonly misstrewn or misplaced as, again, someone crying wolf, someone not being honest or upfront, whereas actually all people are looking for is a sense of relief of being able to go, look at me, I can't tell you how I feel, so I'm gonna show you how I feel by hurting myself, by having the scars to show you just how much I need help. As Diana said, she was labeled as someone who was depressed, who had these episodes. And as a result of that, her image was tainted. All she was trying was, 
All she was trying to do was to be seen and be respected. And it's such a shame that she had to hurt herself to be taken seriously. But by her doing that, again, her image is tainted as someone who's reckless, someone that's emotionally unstable, someone that doesn't have their stuff together. The way I like to explain self-harm to my clients is that their self-harm is just an expression of their emotion. It's them trying to show others how they're feeling. It's a shame because when someone self-harms, people don't know how to deal with it. So they say that there's something wrong with you, that you're irrational, that you're not doing the right thing. It's just a way to express your feelings. She hasn't done anything wrong by self-harming. Maybe the people around her need to take her seriously. And by wearing her emotions, she was hoping that they would do that. But again, it feels like she was pushed aside yet again because she wasn't able to be respected for the way that she felt. So, I, uh, yes, I did inflict upon myself. I didn't like myself. I was ashamed because I couldn't cope with the pressures. What did you actually do? Well, I just hurt my arms and my legs. And I... Let's just notice Diana's language in this moment. I just. It's not, I did this thing and it hurt me because I needed to show people how I felt. It's, I just. Almost downplaying. Almost trying to save other people trying to play up to a role so that other people aren't put off or judge her or she doesn't feel that she's letting people down. Again, language is so important here because it gives us an understanding about how we really are able to connect to ourselves. And it's happened time and time again where Diana hasn't just said something with force. I hurt myself. I just did this. It's really sad to see that she doesn't feel able to express and be herself and be safe to be herself. The depression was resolved, as you say, but it was subsequently reported that you suffered bulimia. Mm. Is that true? Mm -hmm. Yes, I did. I had bulimia for a number of years. And that's like a secret disease you inflicted upon yourself because your self-esteem is still low and you don't think you're worthy or valuable. You fill your stomach up four or five times a day, some, some do it more, and it gives you a feeling of comfort. It's like having a pair of arms around you, but it's temporarily, temporary. Then you, you're disgusted at the bloatedness of your stomach, and then you bring it all up again. Bulimia is something that affects so many people, but yet it's not discussed enough, because people do it in secret, so it's not in people's view that someone will be bulimic. I mean, Diana looks fantastic. And as a result, people would say, well, of course there's nothing wrong with her. Of course she's not bulimic. Diana describes it so well. By being full, you almost feel safe and comforted and warm. But then all of a sudden that flips into feeling disgusted with yourself. And people use self-harm and bulimia in order to diffuse that emotional tension. And you can see that Diana doesn't just suffer. And you can really... Under and and from Diana talking about this, you can really get an understanding about why people do it. Because she was stuck. She had all these expectations and all these people telling her that she's wrong. And all she wanted to do was to feel in control of her life. And that's what self-harm and bulimia does. It gives you that place where you can go, I can take control of this thing and feel a certain way, do a certain thing, and no one needs to know about it. Because no one's respecting her anyway, so why shouldn't she take charge of her body? And it's a, it's a repetitive pattern, mm. which is very destructive to yourself. How often would you do that on a daily basis? Depends on the pressures going on. Mm. Again, pressure going on. If I had been on an, what I call an away day, I'd been up part of the country all day, I'd come home feeling pretty empty because my engagements at that time would be to do with people dying, people very sick, people, marriages, and all that. And I come home and it would be very difficult to know how to comfort myself, having been comforted lots of other people. So, who's comforting her? Who's comforting Diana? She's going out there, doing her service, doing her duty, without anyone giving her any respect, comfort, reward, or just embrace. So it seems that she has to do manage herself because she's expending all this energy to everyone else, but no one's giving her anything back. It was a symptom of what was going on in my marriage. I was crying out for help, but giving the wrong signals. And people were using my bulimia as a coat on a hanger. They decided that was the problem. Mm. Diana was unstable. And so you subjected yourself to this phase of binging and, and vomiting? You could say the word subjected, but it was my escape. 
mechanism mm. and it worked for me at that time. It feels like it's the only thing that worked because no one was giving her any respect or listening to her. And in fact, they just labelled her someone that was that, that was ill. And therefore, as she said, she gave the wrong signals, but it felt like she was trying her best all which way, and it's the only way. Her bulimia was the only way for her to feel any sense of warmth and control in her life. I think we had a great deal of interest. We were both we both liked people, both liked country life, both loved children, um, work in the cancer field, work in hospices. But I was portrayed in the media at that time, if I remember rightly, as someone, because I hadn't passed any O-levels and taken any A-levels, I was stupid. And I made the grave mistake once of saying to a child I was thick as a plank, in order to ease the child's nervousness, which it did. But it, that headline went all around the world. And I rather regret saying it. <laughs> well, why did she, again, have to put herself down in order to make someone else feel good. Almost that she had to say I was as thick as a plank in order to make people feel that she was, you know, at the same level or less than, so they didn't feel threatened by her. They gave her an excuse as to why she was acting, thinking and being a certain way. But by doing that, everyone then labels you as that person. Whether you've got O levels, GCSEs, any sense of education on a piece of paper, that doesn't mean you're intelligent or not intelligent. There's many different types of intelligences which aren't necessarily measured by exams and certificates. Therefore, just because she didn't get any formal qualifications doesn't mean that she's not intelligent. It just means her intelligence lies somewhere else. And as we can see, she's articulate. She's well put together. She's trying her best. She has such a great work ethic and she was a great mum too. And as a result, why does it matter if she hasn't got that piece of paper telling everyone, oh, I passed my exams? You have to remember that there's so much pressure on us to get these exams. And it doesn't mean you shouldn't try and you need them in order to prove in one respect that you can do a job. But that doesn't mean that you're unintelligent and that's the end of you. And it's such a shame for Diana that she was always tainted as this person that wasn't intelligent just because she didn't get exam results that she wanted. It's nothing to do with that. What evidence did you have that their relationship was continuing even though you were married? A, a woman's instinct is a very good one. <laughs> so you were isolated? Mm-hmm. Very much so. I think that really sums up this documentary, doesn't it? That she was isolated. She knew her husband was meeting his ex or having an affair or whatever was happening there, but she couldn't do anything about it. She didn't feel in a position or empowered enough to say, this isn't right, you can't do this. She had to just be quiet. Again, sit in that room with no interest. Can you see just how much chastation and she's been gaslit. She's just been told, you're not allowed to be anything, do anything. You have to sit in a room. You have to be okay with me having an affair. You're not allowed to be sad that you've had kids and you're going through postnatal depression. What, what's she gonna do with herself? What's she got to do with her life? She's not allowed interests which aren't virtuous. She's not allowed to be the person she wants to be. Do you think Mrs. Parker Bowles was a factor in the breakdown of your marriage? Well, there were three of us in this marriage, so it was a bit crowded. <laughs> Great line, but very sad. By the December of that year, as you say, you'd agreed to a legal separation. Mm -hmm. What were your feelings at the time? Deep, deep, profound sadness. So we, we had struggled to keep it going, but obviously we'd, all, we'd both run out of steam. And in a way, I suppose it could have been a relief for us both that we'd finally made our minds up. But my husband asked for separation and I supported it. You know, a sense of relief, but again, he had to ask, where's her autonomy? Where's her sense of empowerment to do anything? It just feels like she's on this sort of lazy river ride, just letting the tide just take her any which way. She has no control over her life. It keeps on coming up, no control, no interest, not allowed chastised and being made to feel bad for feeling anything other than, well, even when she's happy, she can't even be happy and have interest because they're not deemed as virtuous enough. It's just constantly being told that you're wrong from everyone. And then as soon as she opens her mouth, silence. No one's listening to her. Do you think the Prince of Wales will ever be king? <clears throat> I don't think any of us know the answer to that. 
and obviously it's a question that's in everybody's head. Mm. But who knows? Who knows what fate will produce? Why is he asking her that question? What relevance does that have to Diana's life? Whether her, well, her ex-husband will be king. But this is her chance to say her story, and Bashir is asking her if her ex-husband will be king. Why does she? Why does that matter to her? She's had children with him. She's been married to him. I'm sure she has no ill feeling towards him, or maybe she does. But why is that relevant to this? documentary the fact i'm talking about it is annoying me because this shouldn't impact this video talking about diana's life <laughs> i'm sure you saw at the end of that i was getting a little bit upset because but she was asking questions of her which have no relevance to her telling her story it's just so sad to see a person being treated in that way and you know, this is all based on the crown coming out recently and it would be a good idea maybe for me to react to that. So let me know if you want me to do that. I think this goes to show just how important it is to talk about mental health and for it to be seen so that it's respected, it's understood and people get the support that they need, whether you're a princess or anyone else. That's what I'm going to leave you with today. I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you've got any questions, let me know. If you want me to also do a video reacting to the crown, why don't you let me know in the comment section or anything else you want me to react to. Keep me posted. Other than that, look forward to seeing you next time. Take care. Bye-bye.